Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Hello. My name is Ina Malta, and I'm a Romanian film producer based in Brussels. And I'm very pleased to be hosting the closing event of the ninth edition of Iklava Echoes in Belgium, for which I would like to thank Iklava Documentary Film Festival and the Czech Center Brussels. And for the people who are now watching us, please do, do know that you can still watch for free the films from the, the online showcase of Echoes until midnight. So since we marked the end of Iklava Echoes in Brussels, we are taking a closer look at the Czech documentary scene. Therefore, our discussion today will focus exactly on that. What are the specifics of Czech and Belgian filmmaking? with a focus on film education, festival strategies, and funding possibilities. And we will try to have an overview of the Czech-Belgian documentary scene together with six film professionals from the two countries. Therefore, I would like to quickly introduce our today's speakers, and I will start with Czech Republic, Alice Taberi, film producer. Have I pronounced a bit too French your name? <laughs> Yes, Philippe, yes. Remunda, mm -hmm. Philippe Remunda, documentary director and producer. Indrich, Indrich Andras, I'm doing my best, Indrich, documentary director. Adam Ola, the documentary director and cinematographer. Together with their fellow speakers from Belgium, Livia Tink, a documentary programmer from, for Millennium Documentary Film Festivals in Brussels. Hello. And Tom van Herzel, professor at the Royal Institute for Theatre, Cinema and Sound, widely known as Ritz in Brussels. Hello. And let's go straight to the point. And I will uh, start our um, discussion, our debate with the, with the, the pr producer's perspectives. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to Alice Taberi, producer from Czech Republic, and also the producer of Traces of a Landscape, a documentary which I am reminding that you can still watch uh, online for free today um, until uh, midnight on dafilms.com. So uh, I will make a short in introduction of you, Alice. Uh, you are a film producer based in Czech Republic, educated at FAMU and with internship at, at the film schools in Mexico and Germany. You have quite a solid experience in sales as well. And within the previous years, you have worked mainly for uh, Cinepoint, a production company based in Prague. What I have seen, uh, let's say, recurrent in your films in terms of financing, and this might sound as a, quite a, a bizarre remark, but I come from Romania, is that uh, most of your films, or almost all of your films, were made with the support of the Czech Film Center, the Czech TV, and sometimes FAMU and your, let's call them usual suspects in terms of co-production partners, this is not a bizarre uh, aspect, have been and still are Slovakia and Italy. And I'm guessing that depending on the moment you enter a project, the usual time uh, until it's made varies from a minimum of two to four or five years, right? So therefore my question is a bit extended. How difficult or maybe how easy has it been for you as a Czech producer to make your film, your films, which was your biggest challenge that you had to overpass? And since you have uh, Czech TV almost always on board, which is similar, I believe, to Belgian productions, if I'm not mistaken, be it VAT Canvas or ETBF, when exactly during, during the unfolding of a project do they come on board? And has this ever influenced in a positive or negative way your distribution or festival strategies? Yeah, so maybe I start with uh, how it's, yeah, it's the, it's the normal way how to produce film in Czech Republic that first you go to the Czech Film Fund, which uh, is uh, great now that they give you a possibility also to support the project only for development. So you have one call really for the development, which is, a uh, few years now a uh, way how to really develop your project because you decide if you want really to make it and to make a film from from the from the treatment and then for the production it's uh yeah as you said almost like uh, for all projects that i've made the czech film fund um support and the czech television that enters in the film and uh <clears throat> and for this i think with the budget that we are 
dealing in Czech Republic and, and making films, I think we are able to do, if it's not too complicated, the documentary, but it would be like a budget around around uh, 100,000 euros. And uh, we have, me in Cinepoint also the, the, the good thing that we have our own equipment with, which is helping a lot when you are doing a documentary, not only because you don't have to pay for it somewhere and to rent it, but also that you are more flexible. So with this, <coughs> I'm sorry, with this uh, sources, I think it was always possible to do the films. And of course, when I started, uh, you start with uh, less experience, less money, less fundings, but more courage, more <laughs> enthusiasm. So you do the film even if uh, it's hard and you won't really to do and finish the film. So it was also my case. I think what I've done for my first production, I would maybe not have the possibility and maybe also the energy to do it in the second one. Yeah, I will, I, I'll come back. So basically, if you have the, the Czech film fund attached, the, the Czech television comes like almost automatically or how is it? Oh, no, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think, I, I think now it's even maybe more and more complicated. They give you less and less money. I think it's the, a, a tendency that is in all Europe of what I heard from different countries that the, the broadcasters have yeah, less and less money to put into like bigger films and um, not to the TV, TV films. So it's the case in Czech Republic as well. And no, it's it's like, um, if you have, for example, really a creative documentary and uh, with a, a smaller potential, I think it can be really hard to, to obtain on the Czech television. We had, yeah, we were lucky. Uh, for example, with Traces of a Landscape, it was also concretely with this film, which is quite minimalistic, quite not for a white audience, etc. So I remember they proposed us some money and it was not the biggest amount we could like reach if we maybe would be fighting more. It was not also the last that some other projects I know that, uh, that received and we decided we go for it. And I think it I was imagine. like, um, maybe a good decision, maybe not to want, like to, to risk that uh, the film would not, would not cross like the, mm -hmm. the Czech TV border. And we decided to go with what, uh, yeah, what was uh, on the table. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not big budget, but it's helping you not only because of money, but because of the audience that then, that the Czech TV of course is reaching. Of course. And when do they do come on board, they are co-producers or they are yeah. simply... Pre In our case, it's always a co-production. Um, and co has, has this ever influenced your distribution or festival strategies in any way? Uh, the distribution strategy and the festivals are... for. In our case, it was always up to me as a producer, but it's. I think it can be defined as... Uh, as it is in the co-production yeah, agreement, but uh, mm -hmm. often I think that the Czech TV is giving you the possibility to, to decide for your film and you do the job and you, yeah, you do the strategies okay, and you so, care about the film. So you actually have a partner on board and you are free to distribute your film <coughs> when you feel it, it needs to be done. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And let's go to, let, let's stay in the, in the Czech Republic, uh, but uh, see things from a di director's uh, perspective. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Adam Ola, director. He's the, the director of Al Alchemical Furnace, which I remind uh, again, that can still be seen online on dafilms.com uh, for free until midnight. Adam, you're a documentary director educated at FAMU. Your short and feature length documentaries have traveled across the festivals around the world. What is your approach in choosing to make a documentary? Where do you find inspiration from and how do you choose your subjects? Oh, hello everybody. Uh, 
Well, that's the question that uh, I ask uh, every day, because uh, since I do films, I always need to find topics in my not far away reality, I would say. I started with my personal stories, which was kind of risk in like eight years ago with my film that first uh, traveled the world. And since then, I moved a little bit to, <laughs> to other people as well. And uh, this film that I, I, I directed with Jan Daniel, the, late, the latest, uh, uh, called Alchemical Furnace, is about our uh, like cinematographic hero, Jan Schwankmeier. And it came to me by accident. It came to me as, a, as an offer and that you can not say no. And uh, I'm very glad that it happened. So <clears throat> all of that producing or pro producer's world was already set it up before I came in. So in this case, it was very easy to, to come in because there was a service that I never, never like experienced before. Because before my films were personal, not just in the matter of making it as a story, but uh, also as making it <clears throat> as a whole thing, like since the beginning till the end mostly personally but um, this time i experienced it uh, experienced something else which i'm glad that i that i saw real producers world and i could be part of So it's it's always a, a personal approach, but at the same time you uh, you have to stay open to uh, falling in love with uh, life itself and with uh, what you find. <laughs> yes, this no, project was so. like spe very special. If I can say a few words about it, because uh, you know it it remained uh, personal in a way. There was a there was a very free offer to do whatever we want, and we were two directors so it's also a little bit different from uh, the style that you direct everything alone so there was kind of control system in between of us and uh, producers were stepping away from from the process so they just said uh, at the beginning that we are free to make whatever we want which was also something that i didn't experience before and i think i will not experience for a long time again and uh, that was it like so after three years we came with the film we screened them the film we were very afraid but uh, but finally all things went like this like you are free which also seems to be also personal approach you know that i appreciate because not uh, it's not happening very often that producers is giving you such a freedom this happened and i hope i, I would really love to make my films this way but i know that is not possible anymore well d d don't ever give up <laughs> no I, I will never give up and could i also extend uh, the question a bit uh, because your films are quite different in, from a thematical point of view and for example for this particular one the alchemical furnace has it ever uh, has it ever occurred to you while being in the process of filming and making it and editing it to think what would be the audience of your film? Yes, in this think who would who would who would watch it, for whom this film might be, and who who would who would um, have something to learn out of it, who would uh, stay with something um, inside after after watching it. Yeah, the, from the general point of view, there are like two types of audience for this film. Since the beginning, it was like that. It was set it up. Because of Jan Schwankmeier's uh, person, that uh, most of the people who, who knows the film film like know about him, this is the first part of audience, like the people who who are, who've been heard heard about him, and uh, the another part of audience for us also very important were the people that uh, could not meet him before or didn't know nothing about him, mm -hmm. so. I would say it's very diverse. It, it would be always like two types of people. And we were trying to find a way how to uh, explore this very, let's say, uh, 
special topic to to the people who who doesn't know nothing about surrealism or about the process of uh, filmmaking so uh, the process itself was very important to make this movie happening and uh, this is something that we can all learn uh, something new yeah for sure and it's always i think it's always a very fragile and a very delicate process itself to be thinking about your audience when you're making a documentary and thank you very much adam for your input on that and if we we stay somehow or, or we go to the academia uh, middle corner of our discussion i would like to um, to go to tom uh, from belgium so we are we are going to belgium now uh, tom is a professor at the royal institute for theater cinema and sound uh, Ritz. And Tom, I've seen that you've had, uh, you have a solid bunch of projects produced by Ritz, which have had a beautiful path in film festival. And I would like to know how much is Ritz addressing their students, the importance to think audience, and how much is the distribution and festival strategy part of the school curricula? Well, um, first of all, there are a lot of movies made in our school every year, uh, as well fiction as documentary. Um, it's, it's a bit different for both of them. Uh, the, the fiction uh, production that is, uh, is happening in our school uh, is um, in a way uh, better um, uh, promoted than the documentary um, uh, movies that are made. Better promoted in, in Belgium or across the world? I think across the world, yes, because uh, um, Ritz used to be a, a real uh, fiction film school and it was only like 10 years ago that uh, the documentary department that we had in uh, the direction department, two um, possibilities, fiction and direction and, and uh, documentary. So um, it, it is something that had to grow a bit, but uh, now, so the last two, three years, it's like an, an, an equal output that we have uh, as well for quality as for uh, amount of films that are made. Um, what we can see is that when these films are, uh, are going to festivals, uh, students have to do an effort to get their uh, movies into a festival because there is nobody at school who is really responsible to, um, to promote it and to, to go to festivals. Uh, we have somebody who is, but it's only a 30% of a full time who is responsible for the whole school, everything that is made. Um, who does some administration for that kind of stuff. But most of the time students are watching online which uh, uh, documentary festivals are uh, really matching a bit with uh, their subjects and their style. And then they uh, send it in themselves. And sometimes school helps a bit with uh, asking for a waiver uh, or paying um, uh, an amount to, to get into the festival because lots of festivals are paying if you want to get in with a student movie. So that's a bit the case. Uh, for the oh, it's also a bit of luck as well. Of course, yeah. What, what our experience is that um, sometimes we are very um, surprised that certain movies are selected by uh, festivals and other movies that we were thinking of that would be picked up easily or doing nothing. It's very strange. Um, but of course, yeah, we know also a festival is um, people who do the selections. Um, it, they also have their personality. There, there is like an, an, an identity for, from the festival, but there is also a, a personal uh, preference, which is always uh, there and I don't think that in a lot of uh, festivals it they it remains the same every year. But maybe Livia can correct me if I'm wrong, um, because she's she's in the festival uh, branch. Uh, so for us, yeah, it's 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 
often difficult to um, to think which movies are going to to score at festivals because mainly there's a lack of personnel that could handle this festival strategies let's say uh, yes but also the 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 festivals themselves are uh, often in, in um, uh, unpredictable in a way mm. in which they choose uh, the projects that enter but w wouldn't in this case be like um, i mean i'm just um, thinking uh, be a possibility to have like a collaboration between the production departments of the school and um, let's say the directing department that so the producers could actually learn but also to to do this uh, to think a bit ahead on their festival strategies and so on because this thing with distribution strategies festival strategies impact campaign right now has taken such a such a, a boost so right now, as a producer, you always have to think yeah. the audience before uh, even making the film, it's which is sometimes very helpful for a producer and for uh, the unfolding of the project. But um, and of course, in the end, you just uh, have to do what is to be done. But it's true that it, help, it helps. And since there's, there are so many films made right now in the world and so many films from film schools as well, it's something totally, totally that, that, that we actually need to think of ahead of time yes. somehow. But unfortunately, before two years ago, we didn't have a production department in our school. So all the students did everything by themselves in, uh, in, in a way. There was a practical um, uh, department who did like script and... Um, uh, everything on the sets and, and that kind of stuff but as really a creative producing uh, we didn't have it since two years it uh, it exists and now we see that uh, the students who are now in the third year they are getting all kinds of distribution from mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff which will be interesting because they can support their own movies that they did with the directors of our school uh, but until now, there is uh, nobody who uh, who really takes care of it, which is a pity, uh, in fact, because there are some little treasures that are never seen by anybody who still remain in, in on the database of the school. Yeah, that's a pity. <laughs> but uh, at least we can talk about it. So <laughs> for sure that uh, things will start happening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Right. Now, let's stay a bit in the um, education sector since uh, our um, next speaker, if I'm not mistaken, is still attending FAMU, right, Indrish? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, I just started my master's degree. Great. That's right. Congratulations. So Indrish Andras is a director from uh, Czech Republic. You're a first time feature documentary director and you've also produced a beautiful short film called Pipiat Piano, which is part of the um, Eklavaikos showcase that can still be watched uh, until midnight in Brussels, in, in Belgium, sorry. Indrish, you are you are educated still at FAMU and your first feature documentary, A New Shift, has had a successful path during its development and financing phase. And since its release, a, a successful path also in film festivals, it won the best Czech documentary film uh, as part of the Czech Joy section in Iklava and also the Doc Leipzig Audience Award uh, last year in Doc Leipzig, right? And I know your, your film quite well since, since we, were, we were colleagues in Exoriente where you were developing it and later on it, it was part of Doc Incubator at Czech Republic and ITFA Academy, right? Okay, so since your experience with your film is quite fresh, what would be from your perspective as a director? Um, so how much do you think that the development and post-production work workshops that, that you attended with your project, which I believe that we can all agree that are, are, are a great tool of film education, how much have these workshops influenced the path of your film? 
in terms of creative development, financing, post-production, and later on distribution and festivals. And also as to make a short parallel, but still uh, stay in the same key, how much has FAMO influenced the making of your project? Because FAMO is also part of the co-producers or co-financiers, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah, that's quite a complex question. So just please- We can, we can break it in a parallel. Uh, so let's, let's start with, the, with yeah, FAMO the or, and then go with how much has these post, have, have these workshops uh, played a role in the making of your project? Okay, so I will start with FAMU. Uh, well, the film actually started just as my uh, second year school exercise. And uh, at that time, uh, the school was really like a massive help or it would not be even possible to make the film without the school. Because uh, on Fa in FAMU, we have like this kind of uh, budget system that every project has some dedicated budget you can use to, to make it. And uh, and I was and I and I was lucky that uh, our FAMU studio, like the production department, was open to connect more of these kind of exercises, so I can I could continue to produce the film. And actually, like one year and a half was filmed uh, only as a student film. It, we were working for like one year and a half on it as a student film. So uh, so that would not be possible without school because we, we couldn't you know, pay the car, we couldn't rent the stuff we, we had. And we also didn't have uh, our script advisor, uh, Honza Gogola, which was a tremendous help uh, from like a you know, the teacher's perspective. Uh, but then of course, this, these money were not enough. And uh, the story of Thomas was, you know, going bigger and bigger and was very interesting. So we decided to try to find a producer, uh, which we were uh, successful. And then we continued to, to finance the, the rest of the shooting. And, uh, about, and so about the workshops, I have attended three workshops, uh, as you said, Ex Oriente, Doc Incubator and ITFA Academy. And so basically, I, for, for sorry, for, for people who might not know, Ex Oriente is mainly, Philip, could you uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, is mainly on development and production, let's say, and Doc Incubator and ITFA Academy are mainly for post-production. Yes, that's, <laughs> that, that's correct. That incubator, <laughs> incubator mostly works with uh, rough cuts and it's kind yeah. of like series of rough cut session and uh, teams of directors and uh, editors are and producers by advisors and uh, also um, some kind of supervisor uh, from editing department. It's and for Ex Oriente, uh, mainly focused on, on projects in development or a bit more, more advanced. It is a year long program for project uh, development. And at the, at the end, there is a, a pitching uh, session and workshop for pitching skills as well. Yeah, good. Thank you. So going back to your experience with the workshops and how much they influence the making of your project and afterwards it's afterlife. Yeah, uh, so with Ex Oriente, it, uh, it, it, it's a development workshop, right? And we have uh, joined quite late because we were already in like late production. So it didn't really influence so much how the film looks and what is it about. I think, uh, but what really, really helped me uh, with was like, <clears throat> because when you study FAMU, you don't really have uh, some experience with like a real producer, let's say, because you have just like production department students and like the role of the producer is split it in so many layers of the education. So it's really difficult, you know, like to go uh, from school to like film industry and real not life. like how it works or like any any rules of the industry and who are the sharks let's say you know and who are the good guys and uh, and what are the money you should ask for and not and 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 i think and i think maybe some or our education 
system in Famu quite, you know, can't uh, teach this uh, or, you know, it, the education system doesn't include this kind of education. <laughs> okay. Uh, Where, so, and and, and when, when you say that, you mean like distribution as well and thinking your audience and so on, apart from the producer's field uh, in uh, financing and uh, everything that is, it is included in the making of the film, right? I, I believe you, you refer to the whole package. Yeah, we have quite like, like, like a lot of, uh, you know, uh, subjects about uh, distribution and festival strategies, strategies etc. But we don't have like anything about what you should have in a contract as a director or, you know, like what are, uh, what are the possibilities, how the professional filmmaking really looks like, how, how, what are the conditions. So, um, so, and because on at Ex Oriente, I, I have met uh, so many producers. Uh, so that was really, you know, I, I have, I, I learned like and everything I, I needed to, I feel. Uh, so, so, so that was really great. And, and also I think Ex Oriente really helped me as a debuting producer as well, uh, like to, to learn like almost everything I, I have needed. And, and of course, also, I, I think it, it helped with the future distribution and the pitching and et cetera. Um, and I will just, I will just shortly talk about Dog Incubator and ITFA Academy as well. And, and Dog Incubator, uh, I think uh, we were quite suspicious when we went to Dog Incubator that they will be trying to tell us how the good film should look like, you know. <laughs> And we didn't really believe, you know, that could work. But it was really something different uh, because what we have got was a really good feedback from quite, you know, uh, a good spectrum of audience to our film and which really helped us to, to finish the film. And we also, you know, got two other script advisors who worked with us really closely, like for, for one year. And it was a tremendous help, like to have somebody, some, some another script advisor, uh, you know, uh, to to work on, to work with on the film. So so that really helped us. And uh, it for Academy, I think compared to Ex Oriente and Doc Incubator, it was very brief, actually, you know, because it was just sure, like, okay. it was like two or three days, and like we and, and nobody of us, you know. Uh, got so much time with the tutors and really like to talk about something as on the workshops. So I think that workshops were much more valuable for us. And with, with regards to distribution or the distribution of your film and the, the festival strategies and so on, how much have these workshops, particularly Doc Incubator, because it's longer. So you're also saying that the, the ITFA Academy is, well, it's shorter, so it's, it has a much more briefer um, impact on you. How much have they uh, helped you or um, lead the way for you to have a good afterlife of your film? Uh, yeah, well, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Because, because it's still uh, in the making, so because, your, your film is still traveling. Yeah, that's right. But we had, you know, so many discussions with so festival, so many festival representatives, and so much of like festival strategy thinking, etc. But after all, like most of the festivals didn't work out really. <laughs> so uh, what really worked out for us was like just to try to submit to every uh, good festival like where we would like to premiere, and and then it worked out in Doc Leipzig. But it was like many other festivals, you know, uh, didn't want to, to screen our film before. Uh, so it wasn't really easy. And uh, so I'm not really sure how, how this helped. But uh, now we are in the project also made by IDF, uh, Doc Caravan, uh, which is uh, doing the festival distribution for us. And that's a tremendous help because uh, otherwise, you know, we would need, we would not, we would not be able to to reach so many festivals. And since since your project is quite so since your film because it's already a film, it's quite socially engaging. 
have have you had any input from these workshops with regards to what we now call impact campaign or how you could engage your audiences into come and, coming and seeing your film? Has this helped you in any way into setting up like a, let's say a, an overview or how your audience might look like and which would be the platforms in terms of, I don't know, VOD or TV, et cetera, that could um, be accessible for your film in an ideal world, let's say, because no one, none, never, you, you, you never can get exactly what you want, but at least uh, what you need. <laughs> But do you mean connected with an uh, impact campaign? Like about... How, how have, have these workshops, let's say, um, made and gave you some guidelines in order to how to reach your, your audience in terms of distribution? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, they gave us many guidelines, to be honest. But uh, uh, after all, like many of these ways didn't, didn't work for us in a way. Uh, maybe we were just not lucky, you know, or uh, we did something wrong. Uh, I don't know, but uh, 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 but with impact campaign, you know, we have, for example, for cinema distribution, we have a Czech distributor. Uh, we and we are working closely with him on some impact campaign and with some festivals as well. But uh, yeah, but we are kind of just doing it now. Okay. Good. Well, good luck on that. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Right. So let's uh, let's still stay in the Czech Republic. Um, and the, the next speaker that I would like to address a question to is Filip Remunda, director and producer, and my former tutor in Exoriente twice uh, in a row. Dear Filip. Um, all of your projects, uh, be them directed or produced by you, are revealing controversial and strong themes and subjects. From Putin's Witness or Under the Sun, which you have produced, to Czech Dream, Czech Journal, just to name a few, or to the latest Once Upon a Time in Poland, which, again, you can still watch uh, online for free until midnight. Philip, how do you choose your subjects and your themes? And what's the biggest challenge that you've been faced with in making a film reach the screen? Making film with? How, how, what, what was your biggest challenge that you were faced to in making a film reach the screen? Okay, so probably uh, how uh, do I choosing the topics? I think the topics are choosing me usually that I'm tuned uh, to some sensitivity and on this sensitivity, I'm trying to communicate with the world and probably that's the matter how uh, I'm meeting uh, topics and how I'm developing topics into the films. I think it is pretty much the similar as Adam said before me and uh, a lot of other filmmakers that we can't say that we are artificially uh, dreaming about our future topics and then we are casting these topics with some real characters from like reality in order to make documentary films. Most of the times uh, I'm meeting somebody just by chance working on another film and there, there we are. This is a character of my new film. So, And in this particular case, why we started to make film once upon a time in Poland or Polish God, what was the working English title, uh, mm, it was the first time in my life when uh, I was drafted as director by production company uh, and they hired me and Vít Klusák to make film about uh, religious questions in Poland. That's how it all started. And because I had some experience with uh, people from Poland whom I met uh, as a Gastarbeiter working at the early 90s in, in Holland and my best friends there were guys from Poland. So they taught me uh, their language and um, some, uh, some other things about the country. And uh, then I met a lot of Polish, a uh, lot of filmmakers coming from Poland uh, when I was lecturing Exoriente Film Workshop. So for me, it was natural 
uh, natural to answer yes, that I really would like to uh, uh, be part of the team making film in Poland because I was just curious about country, which we with, with, uh, we share almost same language. We, I hope, understand more or less each other. We share culture, we share history, but we are so different. So that was a challenge. And that was a main question to me, how same and how different are we as the two nations? And uh, what was the biggest challenge uh, while working on this film? I guess that was very unusual setup because this was not typical documentary. Uh, we shot it in a form of kind of like um, participative documentary because we have two film crews in this film. One film crew uh, making film about Polish religiosity and then other film crew making film about this first film crew and that was all connected. So altogether sometimes we were like 10 to 15 people as a documentary crew what as you can imagine is very unusual and that the cause that we were absolutely not flexible. So we were like very slow and all the production was very similar to fiction, fiction film. So we couldn't uh, react uh, in any occasion very fastly. So that's why we miss a lot of important moments in Poland, for example. Yeah, so that was the biggest challenge, how to direct this colos. And also there was a, you know, this, situation that you are making film in international crew and one part of the crew comes from Czech Republic and other part of the crew comes from Poland and sometimes we had a feeling like that we were divided for two groups although we were working on one film that was another challenge how to unify these two nation uh, film crew very inspiring so I I, I think the I think it should be just uh, inspirational into watching the film uh, as much as it can still be uh, accessible um, today in Belgium. Thank you very much, Philip. And uh, for the, the closing um, speaker, we are, um, we are going back to Brussels and we are closing with uh, one of the last stages let's say of a, of a film even if uh, it can also be seen as a, one of the first stages in the afterlife of the film and we are talking about film festivals uh, Livia Tinka is a documentary programmer for Millennium Documentary Film Festivals in, in Brussels and Livia before that you've also collaborated with the uh, Ghent Film Festival and Brussels Film Festival Therefore, you have quite a solid perspective on the documentary landscape uh, around the world, but also um, in Belgium. As a programmer, what would be for you the three main criteria in selecting, in selecting a film for your festival? Uh, hearing both uh, Tom and uh, Indrich, I was really asking myself, uh, I was trying to find actually a system for how we do it, you know, trying to objectify the film selection. And uh, if I'm honest, I would say um, the sensibility and the intuition is very important. But this is something that we uh, programmers, I guess, we keep it for ourselves as a variable. We don't usually talk about this. Uh, of course, um, objectively, there's the, the festival identity. In our case, we are really looking for character-driven films, uh, engaged cinema. Uh, we are very interested in promoting young directors uh, and first films. Um, we always have an accent on actuality, so films that really uh, tackle the modern problems. Um, and I'd say uh, these are the yes, th these are the main criteria. But uh, we also have to be personally touched by the subject and by the way the film is uh, made and uh, treated. Because um, I have to say that um, it depends on the size of the festival, obviously, and also on the number of films that are submitted each year. But there are lots of films and we see lots of subjects every, subjects, uh, every year. So we always try to um, find a new way of expression. So 
this is like a guilty pleasure, I guess. We always want to find the new gem, the new uh, point of view, uh, the new cinematic language. So uh, I guess all this uh, works together in the film selection. Okay, that's good to know for, uh, for, every, for everyone, I think. And to extend a bit the, the question, even if maybe it's not particularly your field, but I, I know that uh, at your festival at Millennium, you also have like an industry section, right? Which is meant for uh, mainly for uh, Belgian projects that are in exactly. development. Yes. yes. So we have a section uh, in, this, in this case, I'm actually reacting to what Tom was saying uh, earlier. Um, Belgium is a very special uh, country in which way is um, we have around, I think, 15 film schools uh, in all the different sections. So Brussels, Wallonia and also the Flemish side. So this, I think it's unexpected. And uh, when I say it all the time, uh, people are surprised that there is so much diversity. Uh, in film schools. So um, I'm starting a bit, uh, I'm answering your question, but I'm making a sort of a context. So we decided years ago to make a competition dedicated to young talents. And we collaborate with all Belgian film schools every year, they send us their film production. So uh, in a way we came uh, to meet the film schools and kind of uh, give an answer to what Tom was saying. It's very hard to distribute all those uh, uh, films every year. So uh, we receive them every year, we screen them, we make a selection. Uh, we generally uh, choose film from about six, eight, ten, depending on uh, the quality and uh, the number we receive. And um, so this is the first level of uh, the profession, the professionalization of film students, because uh, what Tom said earlier is very true. They finish the school and they're confronted with a very competitive uh, industry and they are not prepared during the, the school years to face this. And in order to give a helping hand to this, we have a national forum dedicated to first and second uh, film projects where they can pitch them uh, in front of uh, film professionals, receive feedback um, and help them uh, construct a better uh, pitch, file, teaser for, uh, for afterwards. Because obviously they start here, but then they will go internationally as, uh, as we already heard. And this is meant for short projects or feature length? Uh, both, we, we take both actually. And this has been going on for a few years. So you are, let's so say, testing the the landscape, how... So how... Um, both the competition and the forum actually started uh, the same uh, time. So it was in uh, 2016. So we are at the, running at the fifth edition with both of uh, events. And each year uh, we're expanding it a bit more, adding uh, new partners, adding French distributors, for example, because lots of the projects are French speaking. And uh, we always try to have a new professional guests that can offer uh, an input and prepare them for what's next. Mm. And I guess you've, you've seen that it, it has been working, right? So you've seen the results. Definitely, definitely. And uh, well, yeah, some, some of the projects are still on, uh, on the making. What's very interesting that uh, some of them start uh, here, then they go to, to Cannes, to other festivals, to ITFA, and they, they're, uh, you know, they're evolving step by step. And uh, I'm not bad. <laughs> It's, it's not bad, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, for us, it's, uh, it's very reassuring because um, now there is a demand for this locally. And uh, the fact that it opens uh, gates later on, it's, uh, it's what we want for them. Yeah, for sure. And since you've, you've, you've seen that this exercise can actually become a concrete model, are you also considering uh, extending a bit the industry uh, part into making it for international or at least more European projects as well and not only uh, remain local for the Belgium? The Belgian, so uh, we're actually having two, we actually had for 2020 uh, several expansion plans that were uh, brutally cut off by the situation because um, there are two directions right now. One is to develop to the French speaking countries and this includes uh, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and also Canada and Quebec, and have like 
friends, uh, I'm uh, considering it uh, <laughs> already acquired. So this is uh, in order to reinforce the position of the French speaking films in these countries. And uh, as uh, it's more of a like, it's more of a, let's say a personal uh, preference for East film, for films done in the Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. We're also um, collaborating with uh, other forums like the one from Flyer Tiana from Perm, for example. So uh, we're collaborating with Eastern festivals to, uh, to have them also uh, here. It is not clear in 2021 that this will be a possible uh, live. I think we're gonna still be in the same uh, Zoom format as we are now, but. Yeah, but still, I mean, it shouldn't be an obstacle. I mean, if you no. if you are really considering in expanding your uh, industry section, I think it will only be for the best because having, I mean, co-production is the um, is the main word when we talk now about uh, film production. So collaboration and co-production is uh, should be at at it's at home, <laughs> uh, particularly uh, for a for a for a European film festival or international film festival like yours. And I'd say particularly in Brussels, because um, as we were discussing before, everybody in Brussels comes from somewhere else. So there is this synergy of uh, even us, even us, even us. So there's a synergy of uh, sensibilities, professional uh, background from different countries. So it's really, uh, yeah, it's a great uh, place to, to do this. Well, then you, there you have it. I keep my fingers crossed for you that it will work out. Thank, Thank you. you very much to everyone. Uh -huh. um, if there are, uh, Eva, any, uh, anything uh, else that could follow next, just tell us. Otherwise, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> with, with our talk and thank you very much for, for your presence and for your openness and for the inspiration as well. If we have any uh, questions from, from the people that are with us, If not, we can uh, we can continue the the after party in between us. Because I think we have like a few more minutes left. If not, you are um, open to have your own, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, out of the box uh, reaction to the Czech documentary, Czech Belgian uh, film scene. Uh. So we have no questions from the audience. Everything was crystal clear. Thank you again to uh, everyone, to Alice, Tom, Indrish, Adam, Philip, and Livia. And I hope to, uh, we will be able to actually meet in person again with Philip and for the first time with uh, each and every one of you. Thank you very much. And until very soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good to see you. You bye too. Bye. <laughs> bye.